Right, so thank you very much for joining me. Um, what I will do is, if I just share my screen. I'm just going to look at um, a little bit of an introduction to me, first of all. So I did think that this was one of the things I was asked to give a wee presentation on what we do at our college um, and why we're as successful as we are. Um, we only deliver a two-year computer-aided architectural design and technology program. And if we look at the statistics over the last couple of years, after our two years, um, our students are um, out of a class of maybe around about 25, 24, 25. We had two of them going off to university where they went straight into third year and every other student actually was going into employment. Um, obviously, that's after two years. This year has not quite been the same because there's been a bit of a recession, lots of offices closing down. But in the past couple of weeks, we're seeing that um, a bit of a resurgence in that as well. And we're seeing lots of our students who graduated in the summer with their HND, their second year, um, are now looking at employment. Um, and again, that happens directly through us. So I wanted to say a wee bit about, first of all, me and how I got to where I got to, just quickly, um, to explain and how our courses were then developed. So I am an architectural technologist myself. I went through um, the college course that I now teach on. In fact, every single lecturer um, in our college, we have seven lecturers who have all been through our college, either through the CAD, mechanical CAD course, or the architectural design technology course. But every, every one of the seven lecturers that teach on our courses have all been students at some point on our courses. Um, so I'm an architectural technologist. I graduated from Edinburgh Napier University. I did go through the first two years at my local college, which was New College Lanarkshire, where I now teach. And I, I went into third year at Edinburgh Napier and fourth year. And I did third year and fourth year part-time while teaching at um, New College Lanarkshire on the courses. So I'm principally, I'm a lecturer. I'm the, the lead person for the second year computer aided design technology course. I'm also the chairperson through the Scottish Qualifications Authority. And that's really for designing any of the, the courses. I kind of lead that. And I work with the World Skills UK. Uh, I'm the BIM training manager for the BIM squad for the Team UK. And I'm also the international BIM expert for the UK on behalf of World Skills. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, I thought it was quite apt to show when I left school. I left school with very little qualifications. Uh, I was not a mathematician. I was not really into physics or science. I really enjoyed art and I really enjoyed craft subjects. And that's pretty much what my focus was. When I left school, 1990, I think it, um, I had shown this picture recently to my students to show um, just even the, the progress, the progress of technology actually mirrors very much in terms of construction and digital construction. Um, if you look at what technology looked like, look at the computers, look at um, even that, the tape deck Walkman, for example, and then you look at what that has become now. Same thing in lecturing, same thing in digital construction. Everything has actually moved on enormously, especially in the past five years. So when I left school, I was lucky enough to secure an apprenticeship with a local steel fabrication company. Um, and that's what I did. So there's these big steel frame buildings. Um, I served a four year apprenticeship and then I worked for this company. And everything that we did was we designed and manufactured erected steel frame buildings for offices, schools, supermarkets, warehouses, etc. In fact, the college that I work in now um, was actually done by the same company, even though I was then working at the college. Uh, but the, the fabricators and the welders and the steel erectors and things, they also, um, they did the steel work for our colleagues. So I have a bit of a kind of personal um, interest in that. I left there and in 1996, 1997, I went to um, TEDx Equipment Limited. And again, we can see how even just technology has progressed at that point. Um, and that's, I moved into, uh, it was structural articulated trucks. So where my background was in structural, uh, in the buildings and kind of looking at the design of structural steel buildings, actually it's not too dissimilar. If we look underneath a dumper truck, for example, it still beams, it still has reactive forces, live loads, dead loads, etc. 
Um, so I kind of moved into that. However, I got to about um, 1998, and in 1998, I decided I've had enough of that, and I want to move into the design office. I could see the designers who were on about £10,000 a year more than me. They really enjoyed their job. I was not enjoying my job. I was going home in pain. There was a lot of muscular pain. It was a very, very active job at the time. And you could see the people who sat in front of a computer all day and how they really enjoyed their job. And I thought, do you know, I found it much, much more interesting. So 1998, I went back to college. Um, the college was actually called then Motherwell College. Now it's New College Lanarkshire. It merged with other colleges, but it's still the Motherwell campus that we work in. And again, even looking at when I was a student, you had the advent of the iPod. Um, Windows definitely took off in a big way. We had even looking at release 12 AutoCAD for anybody that had, had used those older versions, for example. But with that, I finished the course. I graduated the course and with my background in construction and my knowledge then of using AutoCAD, architectural desktop, etc., I was invited into the college to be a part-time lecturer and that happened in 2001. So I've been teaching since 2001 in the college and I still try to keep um, quite active with industry um, because again, and I am using technology here just to kind of show the point, but Look at how fast technology has progressed since 2001. And if you look at digital construction, it's progressing at the same rate. So if you look at what the architectural technologist did in 2001, and you look at what the architectural technologist does today, it's completely unheard of. You would never have thought of the skills, the software, um, even the knowledge that you would be expected to learn. So when we look at 2001, that iPod, that kind of 1998, 2000, 2001, all the way up to now where we've got this iPhone 11 Max Pro, that's how much technology has changed. So what we need to think about is we can't go teaching courses that don't develop, that don't evolve. So if I'm signing up to a course that's going to last two years or three years or even four years, that course can't have been written three years ago or four years ago because it is going to be so out of date by the time I actually leave and graduate. So what we look at is um, I said I'm a lecturer, I teach. Um, my other principal position then is with the Scottish Qualifications Authority and there are two positions that I hold. The first one is I'm chair of the qualifications development team. So every three to four years we write a new course. So my first year and my second year will be completely scrapped and will be completely rewritten. What I have to do is I've, me and the other lecturers involved in that, so all the other lecturers from other colleges that deliver the same course in Scotland, as well as industry um, engagement. Um, personally, in our course, we've got 46 companies that we work with regularly. And each of those 46 companies help us design the best course. But what we've got to look at is, if it takes us two years to write that course, Already, if you say this is what the architectural technologist is doing today, it's going to be two years out of date. We really have to try and guess, an educated guess along with these industry employees, these people that are leading BIM, architectural technology and so on. We've got to look at that and say, what do you think those employees will be doing in five years time, eight years time? So by the time two years comes and we've written a course and then it's delivered, that's four years because the students have been with us for a further two years. So there's four years where I'm already thinking four years or maybe eight years ahead in the future. Once that's written, then the qualification support team comes in and that's looking at the lecturers that are good at certain subjects can also assist other lecturers that are maybe not so good in other subjects. Um, so maybe an architect, for example, who's teaching design on the architectural technology course can help other colleges. Um, I'm pretty good on the BIM side of things, so what I'll do is I'll spend time with the other lecturers, both in our college and in the other colleges, and actually teaching them BIM and what BIM is and working to the standards and stuff. Um, so I think that's pretty relevant, that's really up to date. On the back of um, the success I've discussed with New College Lanarkshire students, there is now a brand new competition and it's been running since 2018 and it's the World Skills Building Information Modeling Competition. It's kind of changing into digital construction, but the source, the, kind of, the core behind it is building information modeling. 
And what we're running with that is um, all the students in the UK on every single digital construction course, whether that's architecture, architectural technology, structural, civil, doesn't matter what it is. Um, they should have building information modeling units within their course. And what we are allowing them to do is take their best building information modeling students, if you like, their core from each university, college, apprenticeship, training center, and actually put them against each other to see who is teaching the best and who have the best students in terms of um, building information modeling. Now, it's not just building information modeling. I think there's something like 70 different competitions or 70 different skills, and building information modeling is just one of them. Um, on the back of that, what I'll show you in a little minute is that the best three students in the whole of the UK actually all came from my college. So we have Mona, Darren, and Cora. Um, so because the three students actually came from our college, they will train now until September 2021. And then the best one of those three get to then go to Shanghai in September and compete against the Chinese students, students from Hong Kong. We have Russian students as well, Irish students. There's now some African nations as well involved. Um, and what we're doing is we're saying this is the best student for BIM in the whole of the UK and putting BIM up there and putting the UK up there as our training courses, if you like. Um, so on that respect, I also then get to speak to the other nations, so Russia, Ireland, um, looking at Hong Kong, China, etc. And I'm trying to explain to them what BIM is in the UK, especially what BIM education is as well in the UK. Hence why that's, that's a brand new post where um, I'm, it's known as the, the kind of industry expert for BIM. So I kind of pointed out some of the projects um, that I have worked on. I have built many, many schools, colleges, uh, warehouses, factories, etc. But uh, I've created dumper trucks as well, helped work on that. But here's a photograph here of one of my most successful projects, I've got to say. Um, for me, it's really all about now the students. And this was my second year group of students from not this year finishing, but actually the year before. Um, and it's just one of the most recent photos that I actually had on my computer. Um, I did say that it's going to, it's, it's, it's a great feeling um, having a building that is, is open publicly and you think I had a hand in either the design, the structural design, the fabrication, the steel erection for that. Um, but gives you a lot more satisfaction looking at this photo and saying in this photo, um, there is probably two of these people that I know are still at university. Um, they've kind of gone and progressed to university, but the majority of these students left after their second year and went straight into employment. Um, four of these students were taken on by Baker Hicks Morgan Sindel Group straight away. Um, they were just all employed into the one office. So I did point out, we, I started in 2001, it's now 2020, so I have a big anniversary next year, obviously. Um, but I have taught initially on the CAD course, which is a computer-aided drafting and design course. And we also offer a computer-aided architectural design and technology course. And I think the big difference between our course and a lot of the courses that are out there is it is a computer-aided. Um, the focus for us genuinely is on the software. What we look at is if each of these students left them and went into one of my 46 industry partners, they need to sit down at a desk and be able to do a job straight away. Not sit and shadow somebody and actually learn, it's sit down and say, right, give me the project, I can run with that. I know how to uh, work with that. I know how to name it as per BIM 19650 standards. I know how to validate a model. I know how to collaborate to BIM 360, etc. Um, and that really is help. These 46 industry partners that I mentioned, they work with us regularly. A lot of these companies actually employ past students and it's the past students themselves that are maybe the BIM managers, the office managers, etc. Um, one of the biggest things that I feel is really important, I've put at the bottom, is CPD. If I left industry in 2001, I showed you guys how technology progresses, how quickly technology progresses. I've explained how quickly construction detailing, for example, might change, just depending on what, what software that you're using. CPD for us is actually really, really important. Um, and we'll do that by either volunteering our time to sit and work with some of these partners or actually just training companies. Um, and I know Lisa's in this one as well. You'll see Lisa is one of the NCL staff. And Lisa and I do lots of commercial training. And that's where we find out how relevant our courses still are. 
Um, so there would be our squad. These at the time, this was the ten best students in architecture, arch construction, um, digital construction in the UK. We had some from London South Bank University, Oxford Brook University, uh, Middlesex University, and New College Lanarkshire. And so the best ten basically came from those four centres all over the UK. And they were there for um, three days. They were in the NEC in Birmingham at the World Skills Live event, and they were competing over three days. So they had a project that basically lasted them three full days, um, competing against each other to see who was the best. So there's the result in the last one. So we had um, Sophie, who was actually a new College Lanarkshire student. Um, she won the gold medal. So over three days of competing, the whole thing was then judged. She then went on to win the BIM show live, uh, one to watch out for it was called, so it was a rising star, who are the young people to watch in digital construction, who are um, doing great things, and then the following year, you can see that's me a little bit um, excited, we won New College Lanarkshire, our tiny little college, won best BIM training programme in the entire UK, and we were up against Balfour PT. Um, we were up against um, some of the, the kind of larger, some of the Autodesk training sites and things as well. Every college, every university, um, and our, our wee college won that. And it won it for this reason here, our students. There's the three, right now as it stands, the three best architectural technology, best three digital construction students in the whole of the UK. So we've got Mona in the top left, Connor and Darren. They all had been students of mine, um, and they sat the World Skills competition. They are in that group, and they didn't win, but they are the three highest placed young people. Um, so in the UK, you can go to World Skills no matter what age you are, but to compete in the international competition, you're not allowed to be 25 or over. So we're looking at very young students here, um, and on the back of that, all so you've got Mona, Connor, and Darren, and then Patricia, who's not there, were all employed by the judges. So we had Baker Hicks, who were the judges of the competition, and they were so impressed that they employed them. And at this point, these three were still only halfway through their second year. Um, so they were only six months through their second year at college. So there we go. That was be the first little part. So I thought that's quite an introduction to me before we go and look at um, some of the courses and what we actually teach on the courses. I did wonder if I stop at this point, whether anybody actually had any questions on that first. Oh uh, yeah, quick question. Um, yeah. The BIM skills, yep. you, you say you have to be a student to take a part in it. Right, so uh, what I will do is if I go back again, Alex, I'm going to share share again. Right, so if I go to college site even here, I said World Skills BIM competition, for example, it takes you to the skills. Yeah. And in the UK, so you can do a search for that. Uh, let's see where we are. Find a competition. Um, I'm going to ask for BIM. So there's BIM. Absolutely everything is in there, um, but here is the entry criteria, right? So this is for every student in the UK competing. It's intended for people who are currently training students in digital construction, anything at all in digital construction that has any BIM units within it. Um, however, there's a little caveat to that. In England, it's limited to a level six qualification if you've done that within the past 12 months. So up to level six, um, which for Scotland is called a level nine. Um, so for that, a level nine for us is our, your fourth year at university. So that must be the same for England then, I think, if you're looking at an honours degree. Um, yes. But it says for up to four years experience, right? So four years at university, that's fine. Three years at university and then one year in employment, that's fine as long as you've only just left in the past year, as, as long as you've only just left the uh, qualification you've been studying, if that makes sense. So you yeah. can't do two years at 
two years at um, university, leave, and then go and work for two years and say that's four years, it's not quite the same. So okay. you're allowed up to four years, no matter how that's made up, as long as you've studied within the past 12 months yet on okay. a relevant course. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's okay. Any other questions before I go and show you what we do then and see how different it is to anything else that you guys might know? Uh, I, am have, I have a question. Yep. In this case, it's just for students in UK. Uh, for example, no. I don't know. No, I no. don't have the uh, bar, the RIBA register. So I right. can join to the, I don't have the register on RIBA. No, that's fine. Right. Um, if, that's if you go, you, every single country has this. So I can look, did you say, are you currently in Brazil? Yes, in Brazil is CAU, uh, our Council of Architecture. Yeah, but it's uh, not that you want to look at. If you see here, it is yeah. world skills. So you're uh, wanting to look at world skills. So this actually is world skills Brazil. And here, mm -hmm. so, so there's mechatronics, mechanical engineering, CAD, and so on. What world skills Brazil don't currently have, but it's up to you guys to ask in Brazil, you can ask and they can join, is a BIM competition yet. They've not currently joined. It's only the UK, it's brand new. Um, for example, Mechanical Engineering CAD has been running for maybe 15 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Brand new, it's only two years. So we have Russia uh, and a, a couple of African nations, Hong Kong, Ireland, China, UK. So there's only us right now. Um, scope, you should be able to get them to join though. Okay. All right. No, all right. Thank you. Good. No, you're welcome. So what we do, um, I have a wee look at our couple of years. So this would be our college website. Um, we have our first year. So within our first year, our students come in and they learn. Let's have a little look at the units that are there. So they're going to learn within that uh, form order compositions, which is the architectural unit where we're looking at design. It's uh, out of, um, it's 80 hours long. We have, in our first year, we have 15 different credits and this is a double credit, so this is two credits. So we've got design, which is form order composition, looking at the history of architecture, etc., and how to design. Um, we are looking at construction detailing. So that's the principal aim, isn't it, of an architectural technologist. We have construction detailing in here for 40 hours um, teaching one how to use AutoCAD primarily, uh, but the main 90% of this is really the theory of science, how do the residential buildings actually go together. So strip foundations, wall systems, floor systems, etc. Architectural CAD principles and practice. So this is again looking, using AutoCAD again in this unit, but we are straight away looking at how do you produce planning drawings. So these will focus on building control drawings, a building warrant drawing for the UK. And then here we'll look at planning drawings. So site plan, location plan, floor plans, elevations, etc. cetera. Um, these kind of link together quite well if we're doing planning and building control drawings. And everything that we do throughout the entire year, this is our first year again, is integrated. So if you think week one, lesson one, we are straight into construction detailing, how to design principles of architecture, um, how to create planning drawings, how to use a computer, because not everybody knows, everybody comes knowing how to use a phone, but not everybody knows how to use a file management system, for example. How do you create folders? Uh, what would be an office standard for naming folders and how to organize them using spreadsheets, databases, etc. And then we hit again, these are all delivered in our, what we've called classed as block one. So these are all being delivered together at the one time. So we've got the half a dozen units all at once, but this one is residential design. Again, it's 80 hours. It's a big double credit and it is the principles it's using Revit. So this is 80 hours in your year one of how to actually use Revit, how to use Revit, how to design a house. So if we look at, here's how you design and the principles of architecture, taking those principles into this unit, how to actually physically design a house, but how to use the software so that you're actually able to do that as well. And it's all done within Revit. And then we'll move forward into um, our second one, our second block, 
where we have design management. Again, it's quite a theoretical unit and um, design management is looking at the role of the architectural technologist, but we're looking at all the other roles as well, the BIM coordinator, the structural engineer, etc. Um, and how you work with them, how you share drawings with them, how you share files with them, etc. Next unit, again, single credit. Um, again, each of these, if it's a single credit, is for 40 hours. So this would be 40 hours of visualisation, rendering and presentation. So that could be using 3ds Max, it could be using um, Enscape. So whatever we look at at the time and speak to industry and say, what skills do you need the students to have right now? What software skills would you rather they came knowing Enscape? And to be quite honest, most of the students are actually looking at Enscape this year. Most of the offices want students coming with the Enscape knowledge. Um, they'll look at people who have 3D Studio Max as a more specialist and they'll, they'll allow them to work on that. But most architectural technologists are getting to use now, if they know Revit, they're getting to use Enscape daily. So we've started teaching Enscape. So there's 40 hours actually of just even showing off and creating um, beautiful brochure graphics. Building technologies is linked to the unit that was construction detailing. So if we say we have a strip foundation with a ground bearing floor and a SIP panel wall and they learn how all that goes together. In building technologies, we build that in 3D and we're going to build a whole bunch of graphics, all our different construction details. details. We're going to build them in 3D and make it a bit of a hybrid graphic. Statute to control the buildings, all of our calculations, all the regulations that you need to meet. Here's how you design a house, fabulous. Here's how you use Revit, great. But down here, we're also looking at how do you meet regulations for that? So in Scotland, we will look at um, Code 6, for example, for our sustainability. Um, and we'll look at the various regulations from our local authority that we have to physically meet. Again, still year one. And year one in our next block, we are looking at BIM principles. So it is theory. It is 40 hours long and it's pretty much just me. Um, but it is looking at me teaching the students or whoever's enrolled, what does BIM mean? So what is a common data environment? Uh, what does BIM 360 look like? How do you use BIM 360? How would you, when you say file, save as with a Revit model, what is an appropriate name? What does a BIM execution plan look like? And physically going through all of this stuff with the students to explain um, what all of that is, however it is theoretical. So the feedback from the students is either presentation, or Word document, it's not actually showing me that they know how to do it, it's telling me that they know how to do it. Building, surf, building systems and services, and what we're looking at there is, again, back to our detailing unit, but this time we're also bringing in utilities. So we're looking at our electricity, gas, water, for example, how do you get it in the building? And then we're also looking at how that might be distributed throughout the building as well. And our graded unit. So all of these units, everything that's in these, everything that you've just had is then assessed again in an end of year graded unit. Um, and that graded unit would pretty much just be, here is a brief. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with that. Here's a site, here's a brief, and you got on with it. And I'll see you in weeks four, six, nine, 12, 18, whatever it is that your feedback might be. Okay. And one of the last things that we look at there would be our certified user exams. So we are an uh, Autodesk academic partner. So what we get to do is allow the, the students when they end their year one to sit the Autodesk certified Revit user exam, which is a completely automated exam invigilated um, by Autodesk. The students basically log in and sit a quiz. And when they sit the quiz, it tells them whether they've passed that or not. Um, and when they pass that or not, if you look at um, even on LinkedIn, a lot of students will put up their badges as well. So that's year one. Everything that we do in year one uh, pretty much focuses on our residential um, projects. So students progress from year one. Um, well, actually, I say they should progress because some students actually leave. Um, some students leave the first year within HNC and they'll go into house builders. Um, Stuart Milne Homes, for example, has taken on two of our students in the past couple of years. Um, so they don't necessarily need the HND they will just leave straight after the HNC and go and work as an architectural technologist and for somebody like Taylor Wimpy or something. But Stuart Milne is local to us and they do take a few of our students. Passing the HNC allows you access to the HND, so the Higher National Diploma. 
Um, and the Higher National Diploma is entirely different in that if we look at the units and the focus of the units, it seems very similar. But actually what we do is much more commercial work. And that's what we tend to find all the industry tend to move towards that. So the employment is definitely there. So personal development and planning, um, those soft skills for interviews, for example, giving you interview skills, portfolio uh, skills, teaching you how to write a CV, for example. We do mock interviews, we do work placement um, for a week. All of that happens in that unit. Uh, double credit, and you'll see we'll start to kind of branch off a little bit. And one of the things we're looking to add in is actually an MEP unit, the Mechanical Electrical and Plumbing, because a lot of students are actually moving into either structural or into MEP. Um, more students, I would say, are moving into those disciplines right now rather than the architectural side. Um, but structural detail and design teaches you how to design all that stuff I, I did through my apprenticeship. Um, big steel frame buildings, masonry calculations, shear, bending moment, etc. Conversion and adaptation of buildings, that's a big one, isn't it? If we look at um, something like 80% of the construction in Scotland over the past couple of years was actually conversion, wasn't actually new buildings. It was taking an, an existing building and adapting it for a new purpose. So we have, again, projects within that that we are teaching our students. And again, that would be a mixture of using Revit, but using some of these other units. So, for example, designing the structure for it or altering the structure for it, for example. Commercial building systems would be taking our uh, construction detailing that we did in our year one. But this time it's construction detailing for commercial buildings. Com construction detailing year one only looked at residential buildings. So this year we're focusing on our commercial buildings, um, what would, how would you connect a cladding panel to a steel frame, for example? How would you damp proof a ground floor uh, and a continuous pile system, for example? How would we detail something like that? So we move on to those large um, commercial details. Digital collaboration is looking at the theory of BIM. Um, and for us, this is the one that the, our unit was taken by WorldSkills, this double credit unit, and it's what the competition was designed upon. So this unit is called CAD Digital Collaboration. Is Here's a Revit model, open it, and then put it on BIM 360, name it properly, give it a status code, give it uni class, put information in it and bring it out in a Kobe format, for example. Um, and it's all of that that you'd be asked to do in the competition. So that's pretty much you're learning all of that within this um, 80 hours long double credit unit. And then, um, for people that have never actually been to site before, it's about how does a site progress? What would you be expected to do as an architectural technologist on site? Taking part in meetings, taking minutes, um, recording that. And I personally, I like that unit quite a lot. Um, it's actually quite realistic. I suppose we could say that about most of the units, but that's quite a realistic unit. Um, trying to think if you're just in a classroom the whole time, trying to give you the skills that an architectural technologist would require when they actually go to site. Um, so it is quite um, quite apt that it's, it's quite a useful unit. Then we have landscape design, again, something that we, we're finding features heavily. Um, we've got lots of students from this last group that went out and went into industry and they're working in landscape design. So again, that might be using um, Revit or some GIS software. And then interior design, um, that I think we've actually taken that out this year. Um, that had physical model making in it and, and actually interior, well, design and interior spaces. What we're finding is less and less of our students when they get into industry are actually getting employed to make physical models. So we've taken every unit that had create a physical model from card, for example. Um, we've kind of replaced that and it, it, it should be being replaced within the next couple of years, the next time we update the course with um, 3D printing and scanning because pretty much that's what has happened in industry. No one in any of the jobs, not a single student in the past 10 years that I've put any employment has made a physical model. Um, 3D printing, yep, that's definitely something that we're looking at though. Animation, I mentioned earlier, we might look at 3D Studio Max. This is where we actually look at 3D Studio Max. So within that and advanced digital media, 3D Studio Max and Photoshop, um, and it's taking your Revit models to an absolute brochure quality, marketing level, sellable graphic, um, including those animations, those walkthroughs, etc. And then building information science and then graded unit. And building information science is using all the energy modeling 
um, Revit generative design, for example. Um, if we look at energy modelling within it, we can calculate how many solar panels we can fit in a roof and how useful that would be, how much daylight we get in. And again, it's all the, um, the modelling that's already built into Revit and graded unit two. So if this is all commercial, what we pretty much do is the same thing for our graded unit two. Here is a plot of land, here's your client, and this year you're going to design an office building, for example. And they have to cover every single element of everything that they've learned that year. There we go. So I pretty much have, um, I think, one or two other wee things just to show you, but I thought if I stop there, because um, I know that's a lot to take in, just even listing off um, each of the units that we do, it's relatively boring, it's quite boring, isn't it? Just listen to what units we do. But if you're a student or you've been a student, I think it's quite good to be able to look at that to say, actually, maybe we did that in year one, you're doing that in year two, or we did that in year three, etc. So it'd be good to actually hear if that's, how similar does that relate to what you guys did? It does seem a lot more relevant than what we've done, to be honest. Like, the stuff you're doing in the first year is almost what we're doing in our second or last year. Yeah, that's, um, that's something that we find, actually, Alex. Um, we tend to find a lot of a lot of institutions will look at the first year and they take on a lot of students, but actually um, I think they're expecting a lot of students to drop off. So they make everybody's first year the same, which is quite a generic year. Mm. Um, but, but for me, I can lose students after a year who are going into employment, so I need to make sure they're getting the right relevant skills. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it does seem a lot more relevant to industry as well. But talking about solar yeah. panels and roofs and stuff like that, we didn't do anything like that. Um, no, we just no. we just kind of like learned the programs. We didn't really go into like how they're actually used in the industry. Yeah, that's that. You saw my background. I was an apprentice. I worked mm. in a, a factory where we created structural steel buildings. I didn't learn anything during my apprenticeship that I didn't need to know. That means. I have students for, this is, this is my challenge, right? 36 weeks, that's it. That's like an academic year, 36 weeks. Each week, is pro, each unit is split up into three hours uh, per week. So I might, if I've got a student for three hours doing that unit, construction detailing, for example, I've only got them for 12 weeks, that's it. So for three hours, I need to teach you within three hours and allow you to practice and assess you. But I work with all these companies and all these companies tell me this is what you need to show your students. You can't fit everything in. We really need to cherry pick. I mentioned about model making. How many of you yeah. still do model making on your courses? Oh yeah, yeah, we're still using, we're still doing it, yeah. Yeah, yes. and, and, and for me, I love model making, right? I love it. I'm, I'm really upset to take it out, but I have to take it out. Do you know if I want to do model making? Actually, I'll need to go and do that in my spare time because mm. I really enjoy it. And I want to do it, great, but I shouldn't be giving up. This is how you do energy modeling or this is how you use a common data environment to learn how to use a scalpel and make a model. I don't think that's the most appropriate use of my time, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. Now, Lisa's sitting in here as well, as I keep pointing out, she's NPL staff as well. And one of the things that we uh, do, I think, the most, I've got you for 12 weeks and I've got you for three hours. You will have me in the class for three hours for 12 weeks. I'm, no I'm notorious for this. At nine o'clock, my lesson starts, I close my door. My students have to be in for nine o'clock and it's going to be a break. Fine, we'll have a 15 minute break. But from nine o'clock until 12 o'clock, you're in my office and I'll work you hard because I've only got you for three hours for 12 weeks. And after that year, I would need you to be good enough and know the skills and the knowledge to actually go into an industry. So mm. when I go through all of those units that are there, that's how they're designed. That is, that's it. Um, if, I, if I just go back to share the screen, um, here's... Here's the checklist that I give each of my students at the start of the year. So my first years get this. This is my first years. It's called Revit User Novice. And I didn't write this. It was a company that wrote this. This is what they expect their novice Revit user to know. Opening a local copy, navigate within Revit, fine. Understand how to add view properties, understanding sheets and views and how to print from and so on. So these are all 
how to use a view purpose. These are all pretty basic. Um, how to use objects, how to use filter, view. So if you can tick all of these off, you can go to a company and say, I am a novice Revit user, this is it. So what we do is each year our students put this in their portfolio and they tick this off. And they tick it off as a yes, no, unsure. And then they can edit this as they go through the year. So we have um, things in there using areas and color fill schemes and so on. But if I take, that's Revit um, novice, we get to intermediate where people are expected to create and use view filters. So my second years get the next two sheets. So this is one of my second years. In block one, they have to have all of this ticked off. So they're using phasing, um, they're using phase filters, how to use templates and view filters, I said, use view filters, but also create them, create families, um, understanding shared parameters, how to use a keynote, etc. But even going back to novice, if I go down, here is, hopefully you understand this one, a screen grab from Revit on, this is how you've also got to name all your views. So they understand the theory of BIM, but the second years don't get this part until midway through the second year, um, or certainly at the end of block one. And then we've got the third sheet, so competent. So creating, and some of this is, you'll look at this and say, hey, I know some of that. I can't do some of the things on novice, but I can do some of this. And it's really about the structure. So you might be able to do the first, if you look at this, here's, can you open a local copy of a central file, for example? Can you coordinate to BIM 360? Maybe not. But you can then go to this one and say, hey, I can create a detail within Revit. So this is on the competent one. Why is this class is more difficult than the first thing? So assigning templates, creating your own uh, walls, ceilings and floors, using shaft opening, wall opening, etc., cetera, um, creating in, uh, sloped walls. Actually, this we can take this off because Revit 21 actually allows you to do sloped walls now. So we don't need this and we can update this. Um, and even creating your own repeating detail components, creating your own line styles and so on. So there would be a really good way for us, if you look at that, to say my first years can tick everything off and they can go to a job interview with this and they can say, here's a portfolio, but look, here's my skills. And this will all be ticked off and signed by me or um, Vivian, for example, that might be teaching the, the Revit unit or Lisa, for example. So then we've got intermediate and then competent. So the other one, if I jump back in here, is um, this is, I know I'd spoken about what the college are offering. This is something that's on our website just now and they're looking to maybe start offering this 100% remotely, um, which is over one year, it would be one evening per week and it's doing all of that BIM stuff. So the principles and the theory of BIM, what is it and understanding what BIM is up to actually using BIM 360, setting up projects, permissions, using Uniclass, um, using Kobe, reading and understanding the standards, etc. So I know that that's something that's up on their website that they are, they are maybe looking to um, push ahead. If you take all of these bullet points, all of these bullet points come from one unit. Everything that's up here comes from that one unit that I pointed out that's in our second year. And then World Skills took all of that and then they went and created the BIM competition. So when you go into the World Skills BIM competition and you look at what you're actually being assessed on, it's all of the stuff that's in here, which I spend about 80 hours teaching my students how to do all this. This is about 80 hours long through the one um, second year. But just to kind of show you, it should be sharing with volume, so we'll check if this works. Um, but this would be the world skills. This was the last one. So the next one will be September 2021. This one was Russia. If you think of this, imagine you're sitting at college. You could be as big as this. It's, could you ever imagine representing your country at CAD? Could you ever imagine representing your country using Revit, for example? Wait till you see, this is all the different students all over the world all competing against each other. Salam. Hello and welcome to the 45th World Skills Competition. Just have to pause it. Did you see the number of people in the arena for the opening ceremony? Remember, these are all students. These are 
hairdressers, beauty therapists, tailors, plumbers, painters, decorators, mechanical engineering, CAD, BIM, so architectural technologists, they're all... Apologies. Team UK there, I just missed that. That was actually, if I go back, that was Lisa's student. The best mechanical engineering student in the whole of the UK got to go out and compete in Kazan. I promise that we will officiate наши обязанности с полной беспристрастностью. skills change lives. Make new friends and create lasting memories. And of course, enjoy yourselves. 45 мировой чемпионат по профессиональному мастерству по стандарту Волк Скиллз объявляю открытым. So there we go. That was World Skills. How big does that look? I've got, I don't have any hair for my hair to stand up, but I get goosebumps in the back of my neck. Sorry, I have a question. The um, yep. online course, would that... Yes. Do you know how much that roughly is, or do we have to have a look on, or if there right. is something to I, There is an issue with that, um, in that it is only priced right now, if I go back to the website just to look myself, it's priced if you live in Scotland right now, you can, okay. um, the Scottish Government obviously pay for your education, so yeah. that would cost £340 if you stay in Scotland right now. Um, I am unsure but I can find out and we can put that um, we can put that out to you if you want. We can find out how much that would be. It's 36 weeks long. It would be three hours each, one night a week, and I think it's a Thursday night. Um, it's basically going to be a whole bunch of videos that you watch whenever you want, and then on a Thursday night you'll log in if you're needing help, pretty much. That's what it looks like. Okay. But I can find out the exact cost if you are... It will be different costs, obviously, if you're in different parts of the UK. Or if you're an international student, where that is in Europe, not in Europe, etc. Mm. So it will okay. be different. But I will find out for you if you want to. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. So can I ask a question? How many people had actually heard of World Skills BIM competition before? I actually haven't. I didn't hear it before me. No. I heard oh, yeah. it. I, I was a stonemason beforehand, so I've heard of it. <gasps> Well, my favourite, my favourite competition is stone masonry. Other than them, <laughs> obviously, I love and um, we've quite often actually gone down to watch in World Skills Live, and you can go and watch and stand and watch them all. So all the the school kids obviously get to come in and see it. Have you been to World Skills Live then? Yeah, yeah. So you know what but it's like. I, right? I know one of the judges for um, the Great. masonry. I Great. used to be my boss. Ideal. So, well, that's it. I loved actually going and watching um, the, the the young people compete in stone masonry because, yeah, at the start of the day, there's a block and they have a temple mm -hmm. made and just watching them carve that very complex stone over the three yeah. days, it's phenomenal to watch. Yeah. Whereas the BIM competition is actually a little bit boring to watch, I will be honest. Um, we have these great big TVs, but there's not a great deal on them. If you can watch welding, uh, roofing, landscaping, stone masonry, there's even CSI, the crime scene ones. Um, all of those are great to watch as a spectator, but obviously I'm looking at it as um, I've got young people who are competing in it, I've got people who are competing that that's where the interest is for me is actually watching them. But good for you, that's good that you've heard of it at least. Um, when you watch the World Skills video there that was the opening ceremony, go and Google it, watch the closing ceremony, watch them actually get their medals and see how much it means to them as well, um, some of these people. 
Um, I did say it, it's young people internationally. There's nothing to stop many of you guys if you're still a student or you um, have been a student in the past year. The competition will start up again in April. So you'd be more than welcome to join if you're a student or have been just a student just graduating. Don't worry about age for the UK because there's not an age limit. Okay. Well, if there was if there was any other questions, basically, um, feel free to ask them. And if it is the recording people are watching, I'm sure they can get in touch through the CSN group as well, Alex. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it'd be good to get a recording on there. And then, yeah, if we can get some prizes for people outside of Scotland, I do think people would be interested in the course, um, especially yeah. if it's remote as well at this time. Um, yeah. yeah, that'd be good. Well, not even just that. Um, we are in about, I'm going to say, 12 miles south of Glasgow. Um, but mm. we find that there's lots and lots of uh, architectural practices and um, contractors in Glasgow, but they don't tend to want to come out the 12 miles to do their training. So even mm. some of the feedback I've been getting is if it goes remote, then we'll get a lot more industry from the Glasgow area coming to our colleagues to do that training just purely yeah. because it's remote and they don't particularly want to take two trains and a bus to get there. And then at nine o'clock, they have to leave and head back home again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think people are definitely interested because it's, it's, it's like, even if you like graduated, it's still good. Because I was looking at the um, Revit checklist that you did. I think it was yeah. only yeah. novice that we covered. The other two, yeah. I ended up learning at the same time in work because I did it like part-time. But yeah, yeah, we didn't do anything like that in university. So I think, so many I think we only did the last useful. points, didn't we? We did the yeah. last points on the um, last page, but we didn't do anything on the first two pages. That's why I'm a bit nervous saying that you know <laughs> BIM, because at yeah. the moment we don't really know BIM, if that makes sense. So even yeah. though we've got it on our course, because yeah. I'd like to go into sustainability and sort of BIM, well, I was thinking to been for a mm. master's but at the yeah. moment I don't feel that I know enough to even go and do a master's in it. Um, even if I join um, the common data environment so if I go into BIM 360 I didn't like that yeah. there it said there was something went wrong I don't like to see that um, but I'll sign into BIM 360 just now so just to show you I've got, there's BIM 360, and here's my second year student. So I've got an A group, we all start A, and then a B group, which all start B. Um, and then we've got some world skills people in at the bottom already. But even looking at um, what they're doing just now, they're already practicing. So they're there making architectural work in progress folders, shared folders, structural folders. That's a project number. So they've got, how do you name a file, project number, originator, volume, level, type, role, number, description, etc. But even over here where we're seeing things like classification, um, classification EN451039, so it's an entity. Uh, I actually don't know the code off the top of my head. We'll go and see. And it's got a status code in there as well. So see, we just didn't learn any of that. It just, yeah. that's just yeah. completely and over my head. We had well, been for HD, but yeah. yeah, so me and Hannah are actually in the same university. Yeah. It's a house yep, so I know that the student, if I knew my codes, which I don't, I'm having to go look at it. This, well, actually, I should have guessed because he's called it Practice House, but he's gone and created uh, a mo He might not actually have created anything yet. He's, well, he has, right? Okay, so he's just started. There we go. He's, this is for them. This is not their extent of Revit. Um, what <laughs> he's practicing right now is actually uploading to Revit, uh, from Revit to BIM360, but how to actually name. But see if you look back at this, this is telling you the principles and the software and the standards and so on. Then this teaches you. So the very thing I've had to teach them is how to do all of that. Now they go on and they'll learn how to use Revit commercially. So grid, structure, copy, monitor, federate, collaborate with each other. So the A group and the B group will actually share with each other. They'll, they'll take it in different days, for example. And then we've got how to use work sets, how to use copy, monitor, coordination, review, uh, status codes, it used to be called that in the old standard, but they still need to work to both because they might go into a company that uses 1192. Um, but actually even understanding that part, how to set a location point, uh, how to take coordinates from another model, the BIM, interop so classification manager, that's these, uh, 
uh, Kobe, how to quality assure a model, how to use Navisworks, investigate and identify issues and version history, uh, the standards of BIM, and you're going to work to both standards basically. So all of that is pretty much what they're learning to do just to do this one part. So when you're in Revit, you hit collaborate and it says, what name do you want to give it? You need to know the name. This is it. And you need to know the status code. And if I go to shared, I presume he's got nothing. No, he's got nothing in there. So even looking at something like that, where um, the A group and the B group, they're all going to be doing the same. So I'm not sure whether David has yet. Let's see. Right. So can you see straight away what David's done? He's not named it properly. So he fails. He's not got a classification on it and he's not got a status code, for example. So straight away, um, I knew his wasn't working. So he's managed to finally get it to work and he's just throwing something up just to check. But if we look at um, even Gemma or James, Jordan, so they've all got different projects. So what it's telling me is I tell them all to use a date. So on the 30th of the 9th, but there we've got the 2nd of the 10th. So he's also practiced again on the 2nd. And all he's doing is actually probably just making folders. So each time they go in and practice, they, they use that date as the, the project number, for example, so I can see who's practicing. But there we go. It's, it is there, and if, if we can get a price, then probably it's the course I would recommend for you all is to do. You know how to use Revit, don't you? You just need to know how to uh, save it and how to put it and collaborate it. Okay.